mercy and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My father and I were working on a project. It had been three days since we had started and we were getting close to being done. As I wiped the sweat from my brow under a hot Texas sun, I turned to my father and I asked, so is this thing going to work? Without looking up, he replied, the proof's in the pudding. What pudding, I asked. The proof's in the pudding. We'll know that it works when it works. The proof is in the pudding is an expression that means the value, quality, or truth of something must be judged based on direct experience with it or on its results. The expression is a shortened version of the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. In other words, things must be judged by trying them yourself or seeing them in action rather than other factors such as mere hearsay. John the Baptist was in prison in the fortress of Macarius because he had dared to denounce Herod Antipas, who had married Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now, it's not difficult to sympathize with John as he languishes in prison. He was a man of the wilderness, now confined indoors, a man used to being active as he traveled along the Jordan with a mandate from God to preach, now silenced in a dungeon. He had spoken truth, condemned sinfulness, and Yet the religious types were just as glad he was off the streets as was King Herod. Our gospel reading for today begins, Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Was John wavering in his faith as he was suffering unjustly in prison, or did he wonder if perhaps he had misunderstood the testimony regarding Jesus? Or was it his disciples who were troubled about what was taking place which moved him to send them to Jesus to be reassured by him? Many have speculated as to why the divinely appointed herald sent his disciples to Jesus, but he did. And they asked, and Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and deaf hear and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now while John had heard what Jesus was up to, the Lord sends John's disciples back to confirm to John that he, Jesus, was indeed the long-awaited Christ. What he points out to John's disciples to hear and to see is just as Isaiah had prophesied hundreds of years earlier. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, the, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Everything prophesied about the Messiah, Jesus was doing. In essence, Jesus answered John's question by pointing to his words and deeds. The proof is in the pudding. Now Isaiah's prophecy was neither the first nor the only prophecy concerning the Messiah and fulfilled by Jesus. The Psalms also foretold the work of the Messiah, saying, as instance, this morning's Psalm, Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. When one sees and hears the deeds and the words of Jesus, there's no denying that he's the Christ. The proof is in the pudding. John's disciples could return to him and let him know 
that his work has been completed, that he has truly heralded the coming of the Christ. The Lord's preaching of the kingdom and his call for repentance carries on where the prophet had left off. The many miracles proved that Jesus was the one Israel was anticipating. In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among humankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel. Yes, indeed, John's anxious heart could rest assured. Jesus was the one who is to come. He is the Christ. Yes, the proof's in the pudding. Now John had come in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and their disobedience to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared, just as the angel had promised Zechariah. And yet we know that even Elijah had his days of discouragement. Jesus assured John that he was fulfilling the Father's will. And after answering him, Jesus then goes on to praise John. He says to the crowd, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, those born of women, there has been arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. John was not the popular preacher who catered to the crowd, coddling them with words that they wanted to hear to the acclaims of their applause and choruses of amens. And he was not a reed that was shaken in the wind, swaying back and forth according to the whims of fickle people. He was a man of conviction and courage, now sitting in a dank, dark dungeon for daring to call the king to task for his adulterous marriage. He was the greatest prophet. He is Elijah who is to come. His ministry marked the climax of the law and the prophets. Jesus acknowledges his place and his role in God's kingdom. Even now in our own time, there are those people who Ponder who Jesus is. Question whether he even lived. Are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus' answer is no different today than it was two millennia ago. Go and tell people what you hear and see. As the Lord pointed to the fulfillment of the messianic prophecies to John, so he would point us to those same prophecies. The Bible prophesies that a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, says the Lord. And Jesus claimed to be that great redeemer, just as Paul tells the Galatians. And when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law so that we might receive the full rights of sons. And his great love for us, God sent his son Jesus to deliver us from sin, death, and hell. Jesus came and he fulfilled the suffering and the sacrifice that was prophesied by the prophets. Who tell us, for instance, for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we have esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds... We are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
as we look at the cross, as we recall the Lord's suffering and sacrifice there, we see Jesus fulfilling everything prophesied about the Messiah. From his cry, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, to his last gasp, it is finished. Truly by his wounds, we are healed. As the scriptures rightly conclude, for this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and so that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And that all would know that Jesus was truly the one he sent. He was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. By his cross, death, and resurrection, Jesus shows us that he is the one we've been looking for. Ah, yes, the proofs in the pudding. In a day and a time that's not unlike Judea 30 AD, where spiritual malaise and religious apathy move people to re-examine and ponder their beliefs and their values, Jesus once again says to his followers, go and tell them what you hear and see. This Jesus who came as the Christ of the God, who lived among men, who suffered at the hands of men, who was put to death by men, did all of this to be the great Redeemer and Savior of humankind. As the Bible declares, Christ was delivered over to death for our sins. He was raised to life for our justification. He is the one who came and who continues to come to people through the word and the sacraments so that we can know and so that we can take comfort that in his great mercy, God has given us new birth into a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 2,000 years later, the proof of God's love for humankind is still found at the cross of Jesus, his Christ. Yes, truly, the proofs in the pudding. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life eternal. Amen. We